Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I'm your host, Bill Brewster. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Business Brew. I am your host, Bill Brewster. This episode features Braden Dennis. Braden is the founder and CEO of Stratosphere.io. You may remember Stratosphere.io as a sponsor of the show. I enjoyed doing this episode with Braden a lot. We talk about creating Stratosphere.io. We talk about creating FinChat.io. IO, which is an AI-backed, basically large language model that focuses on finance. I think Braden's a cool dude. I'm happy to feature him on this episode and happy that he was a sponsor of mine. We talk about Berkshire because it was this episode was recorded pre-Berkshire. I hope that Berkshire continues to be what it currently is. A little bit smaller version might be okay. I am back from Markel. Markel was a fantastic time, and I think that Markel is, has got a real shot at becoming a can't-miss event as well. Part of the conversation that I really enjoyed was Braden talking about more features not being better. He discusses what people used to say to him about maybe why they weren't signing up for Stratosphere, and they were citing that it doesn't have features, and then he'd incorporate the features, and they still wouldn't necessarily sign up. And I think that that's a fantastic example of getting to the core of an objection when it comes to sales. I apologize a little bit for the dog barking, but she's she's my bitch, and uh, she barks when she wants. Also, I talk about the Hilton in, or I talk about the Marriott in the episode at Berkshire. It's not actually the Marriott. Pretty sure it's the Hilton. Anyway, I digress. I hope you enjoy the episode. As always, none of this is financial advice. All of the information contained in this program is for entertainment purposes only. Consult your financial advisor before making any investment decisions and do your own due diligence. Enjoy the episode. Ladies and gentlemen, I am excited to be joined by Braden Dennis, the founder of Stratosphere.io, a company that you may have heard of on this podcast and a product that I have enjoyed using. So thank you very much for sponsoring the show and thank you for creating the product. How's it been going? It's been going good, man. And I appreciate your support on the product as well. And I want this interview to be, you know, it's just as a guest and not as a sponsor because, you know, you and I have yeah, yeah. gotten to know each other a little bit as of late and you're going to be in Omaha in a couple of weeks, right? I will be there. Oh, dude, I'm pumped to see you there. I have no plans. I figure I'll just kind of wander around and have fun with people. Yeah, I think that's the way to go. It's it's my first time, and so I'm just going to just go with what seems fun and the people that I've kind of met online. You know, I've, I think I've made commitments to way too many people to meet everyone, but uh, I think yeah. that's how it goes with these things. And that's why I did the opposite this year. I was just like, I'm not committing to doing anything. Smart. And we'll see how it goes. I'm doing something later Saturday night, but outside of that, I don't have any plans. It's just a good event to go like shoot the shit with people. I met Cabelli the night, I think it was the first, maybe it was the second time I'd ever been there, but at the Marriott at the bar. I think it's the Marriott. It's right across the street from where they do the thing. And that was just a super fun night. And I think that night kind of changed my life, hopefully for the better. And it's just wild, man. Everyone that's there, they're big names. As long as you're you're somewhat interested and kind, I have not run into one person that won't talk. Yeah, it's like, you know, you get a bunch of people together who all kind of have like this common interest, not only career wise, but just like someone they really, really respect or, you know, namely two guys, Buffett and Munger, who just like, we've all consumed the same content. We all understand each other from a career perspective and just like understanding of the world perspective. And so many good conversations happen like that way. And also just because, you know, everyone's meeting at the bar after. So it's just kind of like everyone's ego out the door. I think it's awesome. Yeah, I think the common ground is the key. You don't have to worry about opening up with somebody or what am I going to say to this person like there's a strong chance they're a value investing nerd. So <laughs> exactly. there's, there's a, a strong a lot to chance say. everyone's a value investing nerd and like kind of smells bad. I don't know about the smells bad, but maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll see. I just mean like a bunch of I just mean like a bunch of stinky nerds, like just as a phrase. I mean, you know, like yeah. we're all just we're all just like that. 
<laughs> so how did you come about? First of all, what's your background? So I'm, I grew up here in Canada on the West Coast, but I live in Toronto now, so in Canada. And I am an engineer, so I studied environmental engineering, which is basically chemical engineering, but you're focusing on water, earth, and air. So you're focusing on that. And during that process, I got a job working in nuclear power and hydroelectric power. It was awesome. Like I spent the, the summers, you know, in some of the most beautiful and like remote places in, in Northern Canada. And it was a really awesome job, but I was kind of always just building side projects on the side and, you know, side project after side project. And then I was like, screw it. I'm too young to not go full in on one of these ideas. And that was kind of the genesis of Stratosphere, which was how can I get 10 years of financial statements side by side that are easy, accurate, and just like feel good to use. Because, you know, most of the incumbents have built stellar products, but if you're just me, I'm not getting a terminal in my living room, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm a day job guy working as an engineer. That's not an option for me. And and there's been lots of interesting innovations in the finance tech world and kind of where those things marriage together. And I think that they're just awesome for everyone, pros as well, because it's like, wow, it's pretty awesome innovations happening here. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think what's cool about it is when you showed it to me and when we started to talk and why I have incorporated it and part of what I do is it's like one of those products that when I was less of... I guess a younger me would have been looking exactly for this product, right? And when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is basically what I would build if I were starting out and I wanted the visuals are really good on it. I like how many years of the financials you have. The KPIs, I think, are good. And it's been really nice to interact with y'all when I can say like, look, this company is missing KPIs or whatever. And somebody usually writes back right away says, we'll have it by the end of the day, and you do, right? I respect that you built what you wanted to have exist. That's cool. That's a cool thing to do. You know, the funniest thing is like, everyone says in a startup, like, your product's useless if you wouldn't actually use it if you weren't the founder, right? And I had that realization late last year when I was building this product that showed, you know, standardized financial statements, but then I was going on Fintwit and sharing granular data that like I was extracting from the filing. So I'd, I would put up like 10 years of CSU acquisitions or like since they've been public gross bookings or like night stayed, like something that Brian Chesky was writing about in the letters about like this long-term stay trend that's happening on Airbnb. I was putting that out into the universe. And you couldn't get any of it on Stratosphere. So I was like, this is silly. So we had built hmm. up a gigantic amount manually of this data that was very granular. And then we're like, let's just see if anyone cares if we put this on a new tier, target the more like sophisticated investor who's looking for this stuff, you know, like, yeah, because they're going to go to their, their spreadsheet and put out 10 years of visas, transaction volume versus MasterCards or, you know, Disney plus subs versus Netflix. And so we put that out there and it completely transformed the business because that was what was solving a real problem that existed that like, you know, all of us had while building a completely different product. Like you're not different, but you know, tangentially related. So that was kind of the, the genesis of the KPI thing. And I think that's what kind of defines the platform today from my view anyways. How old is Stratosphere? We launched it in October 21 and brought that data out in November. Yeah, fall of 22, basically. Huh, interesting. I think it's a very, very nice addition. So what was the original product? What was like the free product? It was 10 years of financial statement side by side. Now there's up to 35, but it was just 10 years of standardized global statements side by side that I could see and click and visualize. That was basically like day one of the product and people liked it. 
not a whole lot of people, not like the reception of this morning's launch, but some people like maybe like my mom and my cousin, but that that's a start. <laughs> yeah, well, I always perceive this to be, and it's probably through my own lens, but like, man, if I wanted my own, like I said, how would I build this if I was building something for myself? And I like how intuitive it is. I like how you've got, I think to me, what's clear from using it is you alluded to the fact that you're a bit of a Buffett nerd. And I think that the way that it's designed, I think you can tell that through the product, that it's a person that cares about financials first and has gone through many of the similar things that I've gone through or is looking for similar things. The investor tab is super easy to click through. You know, it's just very intuitive. We've gone out of our way to make it like strictly just fundamentals. Like we've gone out and removed features that are like creating noise. Like some of the news feeds that used to come in, like weren't particularly useful. Most of them are just kind of like fear mongering about certain stocks that reported earnings that day. Like extract that crap out of there. I've had so many people like, you know, a lot of people have made tons of money being like this version for traders. And you will have no success on the platform if you're looking to be looking at short-term trading. Like there's just nothing for you. And that's by design. So if we can really appeal to the the fundamentals driven people, then then that's where we can really add value because there's nothing there that buy something and flip it in six months. There's no edge that we can provide there at all. And I think that that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you somewhat limit your target, but you know, if you focus on a more limited audience, but serve that audience well, I think that's a decent strategy. One that I'm pursuing. And I think that's probably why we rhymed as potential partners. What did you release today? So <laughs> we, like many of the world have kind of like, what's this GPT thing? You know, this language model seems pretty cool. And you know what? Like anything that comes out, I think guys like you and I have been trained over the past, like, I don't know, three years to just be allergic to hype cycles in a major way, you know, like the alleged web three that came across our desks. I was so not on board from like day one. Like I, I never understood it. And I, I don't want this to get confused by Bitcoin. I know it's such an emotional visceral reaction to Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin's legit, but I'm talking about all the other crap that we'll bring into Web3. And so many of us have been allergic to these hype cycles. And when AI came around, I had the, the same kind of reaction until I learned how to actually use it properly. And this is not like, Hey, explain to me what quantum computing is like. It's like, no, I'm going to feed the API that they provide with extremely important information and then ask it to summarize it. Like what happens if I feed the entire Berkshire 10K into the API and then ask it questions? Then what? Hmm. So what's an example of doing that? So you put the 10K in and then yeah. what are you asking it? I'm asking you just like, give me examples or extract with the last 30 years of 10K, give me everything from BNSF and tables, tell me why Buffett thinks the railroad business is great, tell me reasons X, Y, and Z, why their businesses are so resilient, why the insurance business is so special, how they're able to use the flow. Like, then it's actually summarizing not just garbage. It's not hallucinating. It's not just fluff. And I was like, okay, this is it, right? Like this is incredibly cool and useful. And so then we're like, what if we feed the 750 companies we have those KPIs on into this model, get it to read, you know, all 3,500 pages that we have in PDFs on Buffett, then what? Let's give it tens of thousands of SEC filings. And then what? And then we're like, oh my God, look at this. This is cool. It's sometimes does weird stuff. Sometimes it'll like, I asked it today, like, give me Terry Smith's portfolio. And it gave me a beautiful, you know, his latest 13F in the table. 
but it spelled his name Terry Terry Airy. Like it said his name like four times before huh. saying Funsmith. Like it's not winning any spelling bees, but it's yeah. good at telling you information that you fed it previously. And so we launched that this morning. It took me a year as an entrepreneur to get a thousand people on an email list or a thousand people as a user, like cumulatively, probably like a year and a half. We launched it at 8 a.m. this morning and hit a thousand users at like 11 a.m. Wow. And it's two o'clock now. It's probably at 2000. I'm trying not to check it like super often because that's probably just not good for your mental health. Just like constant dopamine out hits like that. It's like the, yeah. it's like the Twitter thing, but on steroids when you see that many people signing up. So yeah. it's crazy, man. But I'm happy that we're finding opportunities and pouncing on them. So I signed in through just my Google account yeah. and asked it a question and it brought me, I, I was looking up AT&T's fiber ads. Yeah. And then it's interesting because it, it's pulling in, I've got, you know, the table. Yep. I've got the broadband connections. I like how you can switch between annual and quarterly, just like in the middle of your conversation. And then it's got the transcript, right? So yeah. then I click view source and it brings me to stratosphere. So, the so is it something, yeah. So is it something that you are going to, you need stratosphere.io to use it in the right way or how does that work? No, it, because the transcript viewer on stratosphere is a f free feature. So if anyone who, they don't even have to be signed in, like if they're on a web browser and they click on that, it'll bring them to that spot. Like it's completely free because it's, you know, it's a free first platform. If they go do that and then they they look at that fiber ads and they want to see every other AT&T metric that are in the KPIs, like, yeah, they'd have to have a subscription, but hmm. they can navigate through everything else. And so, yeah, I, I don't know how they feed into each other from a business perspective because it's been literally like six hours. <laughs> yeah. But it's pretty cool that like, you know, I do believe that there's going to be a very specific niche category GPT winner for every category that gives accurate, factual, and useful information for every niche, whether it's healthcare, you know, like GPT is already scoring in the top percentile of MCATs and like final licensing exams to become a doctor, like top, top percent. Like it's smarter than almost all the students in terms of answering these kind of medical questions. There's going to be that for every single category i predict and some of it will suck some of it will be good but this is day one really you know this is like y2k you know like it's super early still and so i do believe that there's going to be some like kind of category gpt winner the open ais of the world are kind of the infra layer that are running this reasoning engine but if you have a reasoning engine and you feed it the right stuff and let the reasoning engine make use of the stuff you provide it, I think that there's going to be some category winners here. And I hope that this could be a category winner for finance, but you know how this crowd is. So it's going to take some time to get them comfortable using it. Yeah, I don't know. I think that if you can provide people with the reason to trust something. I mean, the amount of time that you can hopefully save using these tools, if you can trust the output is pretty impressive. So you are, you're basically using OpenAI's backend compute and you fed it information and then you have a front end solution that interfaces with the user. Yeah. The easiest way to think about it is all the OpenAI's and these large language models that are coming out are really amazing because they're the API infrastructure reasoning engine. So they're able to just kind of, it's not AGI, like it's not general intelligence yet, but the fact that we're already talking about AGI becoming real when last year, I didn't think it was even really possible is kind of nuts. Like how fast it's, it's like the 24 hour, 36 hour, like news cycle of being amazed by something new in the category. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes. It's still fresh. It's still brand new. Yeah, I'm excited, man. I'm really excited. Finchat.io, for those that don't know. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to say, too, is like the reaction online to it so far has been 
extremely emotional. And I think that's a good proxy for a successful product. Like emotional on the extreme positive and the extreme negative. On the extreme huh. positive of just like, wow, like I just asked it for Disney Plus subscribers and I got broken out Hulu, Disney Plus, ESPN subs, transcripts of those numbers and the transition that the business has been under and then more information about the parks business after. It's like, wow, that's really cool. And then like, this is so stupid. I think that without any kind of like logic behind the hate, I think that what it is such a visceral reaction to knowledge workers are facing the reality that their lives are going to change. But knowledge workers need to recognize that their lives are going to change for the better. Do you enjoy going through the last 30 filings of Disney to get that data? Like, I don't think, yeah. I don't think people really do. So this is allowing knowledge workers to use their knowledge on the information being presented, not tell me how to think. And I think that's the really big distinction is knowledge workers in the finance category, every category can use this as a tool to use what they've actually been trained on, not being a data aggregator like via your keyboard. I don't think yeah. that's a good way to spend time personally. So I'm trying to present this as like, hey, look, like if you're the junior analyst, like you can supercharge your career with this kind of stuff. It's interesting to me that people are viscerally negative on it. But I guess it does go to what you're saying. It's also there, there Twitter. Must, like people yeah. are viscerally negative everywhere on there. Like, and I think that's fine too. Yeah. And in finchat.io, you give people what, 10 daily credits? So 10 searches? Yeah, 10 searches. You can pay 20 bucks a month for up to 50. We're still playing with that pricing model. We just didn't want to launch this it go haywire and like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. Ooh, that, that costs some money. Whoops. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> yeah. What does the cost structure look like when you're dealing with open AI? Yeah. So it's basically by usage. It's straight out of the playbook of Amazon Web Services, Azure, huh. Google Cloud. It's just exactly like that. Basically, how much compute power are you using? Our servers cost electricity, space, heat. That's basically what the costs are. Chips, computing power, NVIDIA soaking up kind of a category winner here for this a little bit. And it's the same model. So more usage, you pay more. But the costs have come down so much already in a short period of time for the actual infra layer. So we'll see where it goes. I think that just like the cloud computing costs, you'll just see more competition, more capacity, and overall costs will go down. Like I see it as extremely like deflationary. Yeah, well, it has been what tech has been for a while. At least I think that's true. I don't know how much of that's VC subsidized, but a <laughs> yeah. lot of consumer surplus. The where I'm unsure, or the why and where it's coming from, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure in the outcome. So are you going to, I mean, I know that this is day one, but I'm very intrigued by this stuff. I've been playing around with chat GPT a lot. Yeah. Do you envision a scenario where I go to Stratosphere's homepage and then I have like, maybe I have a question on, I don't know, one of the KPIs and I can just click like a pop-up and ask it something like, is it a fully integrated offering or do you think it'd be two separate places? I mean, it's fine if you haven't thought of this stuff. I'm just kind of curious brainstorm with you. Yeah, no, let's do it. So right now it's a separate URL, separate domain. It's under our company, but separate with FinChat. One of the main reasons is I think it's a good name. I think FinChat is a good name for being like a category winner in finance. So we wanted to kind of utilize that. We saw the domain was available and like, yes, go. You can't enter your credit card fast enough when you find a good domain. And then, yes, we do want to integrate it, but we also want to see if it stands on its own without clouding the offering that's available now. The one thing that I have learned as a software entrepreneur is more features does not mean better. I had to learn hmm. that super, super quick, especially if you take a lot of demos and a lot of sales calls, you can be pulled and torn all sorts of certain ways from those customer conversations early on what they want you to build versus what kind of the masses want you to build versus like what there actually is a product market fit for you. And so you're kind of always toss and turn. It's like, well, this person said they would just subscribe if they had just this feature. They're just missing this feature. You build that feature, you say, hey, Bill, 
I built this feature for you. Here's the checkout. And it's crickets. And so that's really bad signal as an entrepreneur, right? When you're told build more features. When in the reality is, it's just like, they're just looking for an excuse that the time isn't right, or they have other offerings to fit their problem, or I haven't done a good enough job highlighting their problem, which is also another thing to think about. So more features does not mean better, does not mean better business. And I had to learn that over the last two years from wasting a lot of time. <laughs> it's like pretty much the only way to say that eloquently is that you can waste a lot of time building features and clouding the product when you stumble on it for the first time, you get exactly what you need instead of like five things that you need. You just get the one thing you're looking for in that exact moment and your time to value is 15 seconds. I am very happy as a builder when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Are you the one that's doing most of your software development or do you have a partner that does that? How does that work? I built that original MVP, hacking it together, being a developer. I today am not a good developer. We have two technical co-founders who are absolute weapons and thank goodness they're 10 times smarter than I am, especially with building out these products and shipping insanely fast. Like that's the one thing that I think people commend us on. And I'm like, thank you. I can take no credit for that. And so shout out to Ryan White and Kevin Bojan, the two technical founders. And then we have a fourth who builds out a lot of the data in front. And like, I just feel really lucky that I stumbled across that, these guys. And, and Ryan's been one of my best friends since we were like 10 years old. So sometimes you oh, just nice. get lucky. Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you build your luck by seeing opportunities. And I think that I've had more of the former. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So did you have more of the sort of vision of the product and brought them along as the backend support? Is that kind of how that went? I had a vision for what it could be. And so that's basically when I, we decided to pony up on that. I design the product. I figure out where everything is going to go. I think I have a pretty good vision like for how these things should look, how they should feel, the experience, what the flow should feel like, how it should look, how it should be branded. I think I have a pretty good grasp of that stuff. And then marketing and sales is like kind of grinding through that. So that's basically my job. Yeah. How has that gone? It's been interesting. Sales is a brand new experience for me, these demos and I've gone down the whole rabbit hole of learning about sales online and it's just like, it's such a gigantic, important part of every software company that needs to be done by the founders. And it's honestly make or break. Like it, it is a skill. I don't care how good your product is. Like you have to learn sales. You have to learn how to hop on a Zoom call and get the customer to explain the problem they have to you. Yeah. And if you can't get them to say in their own words the pain that they're facing, you did a shit job on your sales call. This is my favorite part about entrepreneurship, by the way. You have to learn all these random things that you would have never had to learn about had you have not gone down it. Well, what's the old saying about sales? Everybody's in sales. Some people just don't know they are. <laughs> yeah. I think it's one of the skills that there should be college courses and whatnot. I sold Cutco Knives as a young buck, and yeah. I thought that they had a very good sales training program because at the core of it, you get paid no matter what. So people have an incentive to say, just come over. And then you start out with the big offering. And then by the time you kind of get to like the part where you're like peeling a vegetable or selling one single knife, yeah. the person's already said no six or seven times. If you get that far, right? A lot of people... A decent amount of people said yes a lot earlier than I thought they would. But what do you think that you were doing to get sales? Was I like your... that product a lot. And I didn't feel like I was putting something shitty in people's kitchens. I felt like maybe I was selling them something that they didn't think they needed to spend that kind of money on. Right. But I, I didn't feel like I was ripping them off at all. And when I would ask for the sale, I was comfortable asking. Right. And I think there's a little bit of young naivety in it where if I ask you seven or eight times and if I'm young and I can just fall back on like, look, I just have to get through this script and then I can get paid. 
it's smart, right? Having kids deliver the pitch is a intelligent <laughs> idea, I think, from a business standpoint. But it's brilliant. Did you have anything that you recognized when I say this and it lands correctly, the conversation moves forward in a positive way? Did you have anything? Like, I know you're probably young, but I don't know that I can pinpoint that exactly. Yeah. I don't know. I do think having the courage to ask for the sale and believe that you deserve to win the sale is a pretty important component of sales. You have to have an irrational sense of confidence or an irrational sense of that they need this thing. And that's the kind of like part that people find greasy about sales is that aspect. But at the end of the day, I mean, this is... It's just kind of a necessary skill. And it's not if you're selling a product. It's just, I have to sell people to believe in my mission to come join the company. Like that's yeah. sales. Like that's founder job one of doing sales. And if you're not able to convey that message where people get excited, then you're just like, who wants to do that? Who wants to leave their cushy, comfortable situation for an absolute slog like who yeah. wants that like you have to be able to convince them in some fashion so yeah yeah and keep them motivated for when the slog hits you in the face right and it will <laughs> it does it will yeah how's recruiting been given the tightness in the labor market that we all read about i probably am not the best guy to ask because there's only six of us and some interns. Most of that's the four founding kind of guys that I brought along. So I wouldn't say I have a succinct answer for you yet today, but I can understand how big of a challenge it is once you get past, like, I don't think it's going to be very challenging up 20 people. I think once you go past that, that's a number that probably is a moving goalpost. But once you go past that now, yeah, you have like intermediaries, you have the kind of like difficulties that these large companies deal with where it's like managers managing managers as soon as that happens productivity slows and yeah. so you have to really be careful yeah i think that kind of a organizational structure makes a lot more sense in regulated entities like a bank than it does in any sort of i found Mario Sabelli and I, that podcast just dropped today, but we were talking about Zuck's letter yeah. and how he found that with fewer people, he's moving faster. And then you see this next round of layoffs. And I think he is looking at what's going on and he's saying, boy, by getting a lot smaller, we can get a lot faster. He's being reminded of what it was like when it was just him and 20 other people. And he remembers how fast they were iterating and moving from new school to new school, launching Facebook. It's true. Like it's unbelievable how much faster small teams move. And someone who's been pounding on this for years and years in every shareholder letter is Mark Leonard when it comes to tech. Every single letter will have some form of small team equals fast for every facet of that business and it's not a small business and there's so many layers and that's been one of the most consistent things in his operating philosophy is small teams like you could probably find like 50 plus transcripts of him talking about it and it makes sense right like everyone knows kind of when they were in college or here in canada university and everyone knows those late nights where you had with just a small team you finish that like project and you're like, you finish it and you're like, holy shit, how did we pull all of that off in such a short period of time? And then you go to the working world, you're like, if only I could get like a sense of the speed I was able to move with some of those things, because I'm not in this like organizational rot of inefficiencies. And those things don't build up over a short period of time. They take a long time to develop. And these big tech companies for the first time facing adversity are facing that exact realization. Look no further than the meta and Googles of the world. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch how they come out on the other side of this. I suspect leaner and quicker. What kind of securities or businesses or whatever do you like to study? I would say high quality without trying to pay too much. And I've certainly made my fair share of mistakes paying too much. 
on that front. I was just talking about Constellation Software. It's been because of its run up about half of my equity portfolio for a long time now. And I don't add to it. I add to everything else and it just maintains that weight because it just huh. keeps, it's it a just juggernaut. Keep, it's just a juggernaut. And I do like some of those serial acquires if it's done by the right management team. And so I think that that's a phenomenal business. Just businesses that are really hard to replicate, kind of the seven powers philosophy. And ASML is a perfect example of that, I think. Just like super hard to replicate. I don't own any of the rails, but I think I probably should. I'm looking at a bunch right now. It's just like it's so difficult to compete with these kinds of businesses. And I do like the, talking about open AI, I like those businesses that sit in the API layer. They, Visa and MasterCard have been 10% positions for a long time for me. I just keep them there, equal weighted. S&P and Moody's, I just I love the rating agency business. It's just like so entrenched from a regulatory perspective. So a lot of those duopolies I'm big fans of. I mean, I mean, well, who is it? And one would say, well, is that priced in? And I'm like, yeah, but 27. And I think that they're going to be as strong producing those 60% free cash flow margins for MasterCard in 10, 15 years, if there's not some gigantic disruption on the payment rails. If that keeps going, then you'll do well owning those security. I'm a firm believer in that. So mostly I'm just on the high quality, try not to overpay and don't be confused. I'm sure overpaid on a few of them. So living in Canada, the resource bug has not bit you at all. You were somehow able to manage your way around that? I have been so gung-ho on pricing power as like checklist number one. I've always been a firm believer of that. And I think this is the entrepreneur in me making me a better investor because I couldn't imagine being handcuffed to not being able to raise prices. Like I literally, like it would drive me insane. You know, one line of code, we change a Stripe checkout on the price. Price of the iPhones decided in a board meeting. Like that's such a distinct business advantage. You have so much analysis paralysis, ocean of decisions of securities you can buy. Why would I buy ones that don't have pricing power? I want price makers, not price takers. And so I've been pretty firm on that for my entire investing career somehow. And thank goodness, because yeah, up here in Canada, minus Constellation Software and Shopify, people are mostly buying oil and banks, telcos. Yeah, which could work now, right? But yep. I do think to your point, if especially if you're looking to hold it for years and years and years. That's right. It's probably a safer business. I'm not knocking on strategy. It's more so I just have no idea or really any willingness to try to understand where WTI is going. I'd say more so willingness. Like I have no willingness to try to study that because I know that even if I come up with some answer that I'm reasonably confident with, if you're smart enough to know, you're probably wrong. <laughs> so I'd say just stay away from it. I wonder sometimes how much the last 12 years have taught us the wrong lessons from an investment standpoint, but I think the lessons are at least 80% correct. What do you mean by the wrong lessons? I'm curious on that. Well, I just, there has not been a price too high to pay for these securities yet. So from the wrong lesson standpoint, I don't think that the multiple expansion that we've seen over the past, let's call it really eight to nine years, I don't think it's been completely unjustified at all. I think... A lot of it has a lot of merit. I also think that we have lived through an interest rate regime that has given gasoline to a fire that was probably rightly burning. I don't know if because it's worked so well, whether or not the thought has been taken too far. And I guess we'll all find out together. My thoughts on this generally have been as a fundamental investor. I'm not, I did macro, like I co-host this podcast and my podcast host is really good at macro and I have like literally nothing valuable to say after he says a long segment, I feel like a chump, 
but it's just the reality that like, that's not where my brain typically goes. Like I'm going on like, how can I analyze this business? I want to know if this specific business is particularly interesting. And that's kind of why playing a commodity name is like just so out of my wheelhouse because you got to get the macro right. And well, on an individual company level, you have to be just like such a cynic or pessimist, but overall you have to be such an optimist. Like if you think about this long-term, and I think if you look at long-term credit cycles, like you're talking about, yes, I mean, I was listening to Howard Marks with the letter that he put out, his latest memo. and Oh, what, what's it about? I should read this. Yeah. But you could maybe give me the cliff notes. The cliff note that I'd like to highlight is like interest rates being that low was a mistake. You just kind of harps on that. Like it was probably a mistake for them being at that point because it pins you in a situation where you can basically do no right if things go the other way, which they always do. Like I would do any job in the world. I don't care what you pay me than sit in Jerome Powell's chair. Like I couldn't think of a job that it doesn't matter what you do, you're damned if you do and if you don't. Like, it's just impossible when they were where they were in terms of rates. So you know, I don't, I don't want to summarize Howard Marks's memo because I think it's worth looking at and he's 20 million times smarter than me, so I'll probably mess it up. <laughs> well, I guess that the question that I come... Look, this is like what value investors constantly say, so it's not like a new thought, but... If you look at MasterCard or whatever, yeah, I mean, you're looking at what 11, 11.1 11 billion next year, and let's even say it doesn't have any debt, you're paying three fifty six eight six five, and that's a three percent yield out of the gate. Look, I get it. I mean, I think it's an inflation protected, yeah, yield in a way, right? Because you're going to get more dollars going through the system. They're going to take more to the extent that they are investing in places. Your earnings are depressed. I mean, I can't see a scenario where a business like that, you could do the justified PE off the... It makes sense. I just don't know if 3% is too far. That's it. And I guess the other thing that's kind of interesting is re-rating from 3% to 5% is a big downdraft. But I don't know what you do with this information, right? Do you go out, you buy... People say, well, why isn't oil capitalizing the, the current earnings? And it's like, well, because all you have to do is look at the last 10 years and it's not too hard to figure out why the market doesn't trust this year. So it's just interesting. Yeah. They've had just perennial underinvestment since 08. And I think with a MasterCard, of course it can re you can have some multiple expansion and it healthily you look historically where multiples are today, even though you had the kind of drag of a 2022 doesn't matter. You just say, where are we right now? And probably multiples are elevated. I think we can all agree. But if you look at like just MasterCard, this is not a business that should be trading at market multiples from my view. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yes. Like it's just so structurally incredible. <laughs> like I don't know how to say it other than that. Like not only from a margin per perspective, you get like guys like Acre, you're just like, we don't talk about their moat anymore. Like yeah, we don't do that anymore. It's too good. <laughs> we don't talk about it anymore, and for good reason, right? It's, I just think that there's some of these kind of structural winners that are just going to keep. I think the future stays pretty good for a lot of these names, and I think that there's the large entropy death of capitalism that most businesses face, and they all will face. But if you got the long view and you're hoping to get a couple right, you probably will. You're going to get a couple wrong too, for sure. Yeah, I guess the funny thing is when I was younger, I used to think that the margin of safety was in the price that I paid. I'm now old enough to know that the price that I perceived that I was paying was probably not the right price because my analysis was flawed in certain ways and certain things I was right on. But anyway, now I think that the underlying business quality is the margin of safety. The skeptic in me would say, well, are you just saying that because some of these businesses haven't been attacked and they haven't been, they're not folding. But I do think to your point, you look at something like MasterCard, I think the probability that it's not winning 10 years out from here is quite low. And in taxable accounts where you're trying to save and really have, if you can live through the duration drawdown that can occur from a long dated security, 
I think it's probably unlikely that you lose purchasing power by owning that. I don't know if you will get wealthier, right? But I don't think that you're going to lose your purchasing power. Probably unlikely. With all these businesses, there's some kind of existential kind of <laughs> on long enough time horizon, this happens and it's a perennial, I guess, eventual zero. And maybe that's true if the payments layer changes and... I don't mean to keep talking about Visa MasterCard, but you know, there's going to be continual changes. What's happened in innovation with payments, you get something like this decentralized currency that, you know, has instant settlements, no fees, doesn't care about borders. Interesting for sure, but you have such a cold start problem. Like it's yeah. such a cold start for a lot of the things that are trying to displace these innovators. And I don't own just strictly these mega shop names, but they're easy to talk to because I think they're in such late stages of power that I think they can actually maintain. Yeah. The nice thing about talking about the big names is if something goes wrong, it's not as if, I don't know, I don't like talking the small names anymore. And Curate specifically did something to me that has gotten me much more gun shy on speaking about anything. So I... Remain so I have a question lift. for you because I've been, that's originally why I reached out to you and like said, Hey, can I sponsor the pod? It's because like, I, I'm a listener of the show. And one question I had for you is like a lot of the thesis that you've had and like, sorry to pop up curate again here is like, they've seemed so complicated to get right. The ones that have gone badly. I mean, like you've had some really good ones too. How are you thinking about that? Like these days like it just seems like so much has to get right i saw so many people banging the drum on charter last year i two years ago i just think things that like didn't make sense to me well i mean look charter got too ahead of itself and then i rather than just selling i rolled it into altice like a real dummy but thankfully i sold out of that around 19 or so and i think that when i initially established the charter position was when they were going through a merger integration problem I think today it's, I probably would have done better in that particular position if I had really thought through, and I don't even know that I believe this or not, but I, the fiber risk is very real. I think anybody that doesn't think so has got their head up their ass. And fixed wireless, I think also is real. I think at this stage of the bet, it is difficult to determine what is real from what is a newer technology taking sort of the easy pickings from markets. But no doubt the competitive environment has gotten worse. And I think the bulls and bears are pretty close on that. And that's probably, I spend time wondering if the return is worth the risk there. But when I bought it, I don't think it was the same situation as it is today. Yeah, Curate, I don't actually think it was that hard. I mean, they were generating so much cash and everybody was still locked in their house. And I didn't end up losing much on it. It just really sucked to not lose much and pay taxes. <laughs> I think what that taught me, among other things, but my perception of what happened there is they went from having the perfect environment to a very difficult environment as a consequence of the pandemic. And it's also, it's kind of ironic how the best thing that happened to them was the pandemic for a little while. And then the worst thing that happened to them in the beginning was the supply chains as a result of tightness from the pandemic. And then they had the fire. And I just think, look, those kind of ideas, I wish I had listened to David Barr who was on here, who said, you can't hold those things too long. You've got to be willing to flip out of them. I'd wanted to own that business for a long time. I thought it was the right time to own it. I got out with pretty minimal downside on a post-tax basis. And I think that's a bet I'd probably make again. I don't know that I would be public making it right? because I don't have a whole lot to gain from that where for a little while I wanted to be known as somebody that like people liked my ideas and I care a lot less about that now, but I don't know, man, it's hard. Horse betting is a hard game and that's more or less what we're doing. Do you think putting yourself out there has made it more or less difficult to be in and out of positions or is you're now thinking just like, I'm just not going to talk about individual companies anymore. Or like, I'm curious how you're thinking about that. I don't care very much about switching my 
position. I guess what is difficult about what we do on FinTwit is if you own something for a year and then you sell it, like I'm not trying to hide from the fact that I sold it or that I owned it. Also, especially in something like Curate, where I really like the people and I really like the people behind the people, I'm not going to like say I sold this over and over again. Yeah. And when I owned it, I was excited about it. I still excited. I love QVC. I turn on QVC and watch it. I mean, like, it's just something I enjoy. And I think it nice. serves an important part in people's lives. You know, maybe they're old ladies. They're my old ladies. Yeah. <laughs> That's my gang. It's yeah. my people. <laughs> so I don't really know. I mean, I do think that I wonder whether or not I see cable through the lens that I should see it through. Or I wonder if I'm committed to the idea that I wonder about, but I don't. I mean, I sold the airlines in March of 2020, and I just think I'm at a point in my life where I don't really care that much whether or not people care about my individual ideas. So I'm reticent to talk, Yeah, especially if they're small. Yeah. I just wonder, like, as a human social experiment, if, like, some of these guys that have done this for a long time, like, what would they be doing today if they were in 2023 at our age and our situations, if they would be as public as the investors of 2023 are. I am always thinking about that from a curiosity perspective in terms of like how that affects performance and mental behavioral biases and how that can relate to long-term investment returns. Well, I can't see a scenario where you can argue that social media, if you use it a lot, is like great for your brain. Yeah. Never mind me refreshing how many users are signing up to my website like every seven yeah. seconds this morning. That's what does that right. do to the brain? I don't know. Like we're all just right now in a living science experiment. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> right. But you know, like Buffett built out, I mean, people wanted to be in his dinners, right? But like he did dinners and people do idea yeah. groups and he also hosts this massive event every year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, social media and the podcast and whatnot has been how I have developed a network. That to me is worth the time that it's taken to put in. I, and then you know, some. Yeah, that's right. And I, I get ideas and hopefully I can either facilitate people sharing ideas or I can actually share ideas. And that I think is something that good investors... Well, I don't know about what every good investor, my personality type can only succeed in that kind of an environment. I am not the type of person that could possibly succeed just sitting down and reading in a room, not leaving that room. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't know, maybe my personality, I don't think Bruce Greenwald would think my personality type should be an investor, but that's kind of to be determined. No, I don't think to be determined. I mean, like what you're building is respected by so many people, so... I think that we can keep score on that very easily. Well, I enjoy facilitating education a lot. Yeah. And it's something that I think I am above average at, and I'll continue doing that. And that's kind of, I think, some of why I've moved away from the stock pitches. Like, I'm not trying to start a fund. I'm yeah. not trying to run money for anybody. I'm not trying to do <laughs> any of that stuff. So I don't really know, like, why I needed external validation and that's kind of something that I've been like working through and thinking about. I love it. I saw on the pod you did with Passy that you wanted to do, we're thinking about doing a like corporate kind of podcast, helping some of these funds do some sort of corporate podcast, get their name out. And I wanted to tell you that I think this is a gigantic opportunity. Yeah. I mean, this is, here's me selling myself. I think <laughs> if people want to communicate with clients in any way that the client wants to be communicated with, which I think is a very 2023 idea, then writing a letter is fantastic for some people. And it's great for some people that want to read it. There are certain LPs that you may have or investors that want to listen to something. And if there are funds out there that don't know how to do that, I do think this is something I can help them with. And I think I can speak fairly competently in, in the field that they want to discuss. So that's one thing. And I also think corporate communications is something that I want to do. But any corporate communications I do, I want to have on the corporation's feed and not my own. So like setting up a podcast feed for companies and helping them communicate as they would want to, that would be something that I think I would enjoy. But I don't want to turn 
my product into like corporate PR. If I that understand. makes sense. No, I get that. Yeah. I'm just bullish on audio, like for the most part, which is funny because I exited Spotify like earlier this year, but <laughs> I'm bullish on audio and the fact that this generation is very keen to just kind of always be consuming information and sometimes visually is not possible. There's so many situations like <laughs> the shower, the car. These are places that people are listening to podcasts. I see the data and that's the only kind of media that can be kind of absorbed and taken in. And so there's this ability to kind of communicate ideas. And yeah, if you're sending out this thing to your LPs, instead it's just like, hey, I know you don't want to read this shit anyway. So here's a, like, click the Spotify link. Oh, here it is. Like, so for me, when I was studying for the CFA exam, I would listen to things. I would read things. I would work the problems. I'd check the book. I'd re-listen to a presentation. Like my brain needs a combo of audio and visual. Yeah. And I also think like if you're trying to get people to like you, which I mean, I don't care if you're writing a letter or whatever. I mean, there's an element of marketing to that. Yeah. Hearing people's voices forms a relationship. And I just think that the idea that audio doesn't have a role is really silly. I mean, Mario Gabelli built a lot of his career going on CNBC and that used to be a form of marketing. Now it's a little bit more democratized. Now you don't have to deal with CNBC as the gatekeeper. Yeah. So yeah, that's something I think I'd enjoy doing. And I think it's something people should do. Oh, absolutely. Shout out Barry Schwartz. He started one for his fund, for his firm. They're doing an audio. And I saw the charts because I have my podcast here in Canada and he's here in Canada. And maybe he got the new show Algo bump on the chartable rankings. But I was like, I sent Barry a text. I'm like, dude, you guys are ahead of us. Like, what's going on? Like, I'm going to need to see the actual <laughs> downloads per number on this, pal. Like, we got a little competition going. And I think it's great. I think that it's great that guys like him are doing that because... Because clients can now hear directly from him in earnest as director of research. Like, how great is that? Like, it's, I think it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's compliance issues. Yes, for but, sure. You know, you were, run it through compliance. And the other thing that I like about it is, I don't know, you get to not only hear what people are saying, but how they're saying it. Like, I listen to conference calls. I don't listen to all of them. The ones that I just want the information from, I skim. But if I like a conference call, like... Restoration hardware is one that I listen to. I like to listen to how Gary says what he's saying. I think there's emotion that you don't get otherwise. So I'm with you on being bullish audio. The Matthew Passy pod was interesting. He made me much more appreciative of what Megaphone could be for Spotify than I ever have been. That was kind of at the core of my thesis was some of those important API layers of the RS feed in the Spotify story. And I think I gave it three, four quarters post some of the tuck-ins and saw the needle not move at all on the margin profile. And then I was just like, it's not going to matter when the core business is music and the music industry is set up the way it is. Margins sure had that nice kind of run up from high double digits to like 25%. And then they've stayed there. So I said to myself, I'm going to give myself four quarters for it to move higher than 25% on gross margins. And if it doesn't, then I'll exit. And that's exactly what I did because it didn't move. <laughs> like, yeah. And I had a plan. And so I moved on, but it was tough because it's just like a business that I really like enjoy as a fan, as a product. Biases start to take over from that perspective. So I needed to set a plan on what my thesis was. And from a unit economics perspective, I just, it's just not that good. Like, it's not that good of business. And I, I think I was wrong on a couple ideas of it being Netflix for audio. I think that was a stupid investment thesis I had. Well, we'll see. Some things just take a lot longer than people think that they will. And some things are not what you forecast. When I started to go more off the cuff with the reads that I was doing for you, I know I got more inbounds. Did you have a sense of whether or not you got more signups? I was looking at them the other day and like the numbers looked solid. What I did notice is like episode five, six is typically when people actually 
take action. Start. Oh, interesting. Like spending money on advertising on podcasts for three to four episodes, you may as well light, light it on fire. I mean, it's not going to be a zero, but they say typical industry knowledge in marketing is you see a product seven times before you actually care or notice. And I think that's true for the most part, especially via like social display ads, Google ads. Like I think that's especially true there. You got a jab times six, right hook seven. And so lately, yeah, I've noticed like it's been a nice uplift and a nice uplift from quality of users because that's the kind of like people you curate. Yeah. So yeah, well, it's a good marriage. Quality people and also like, like actual fund managers. Like that's really nice, a nice lift for us for sure. Yeah. The reason I ask is I consume a lot of pods and it's just like the thing that was always hard for me was Spotify and I maybe didn't think about it the right way. And I still may not be thinking about it the right way, but it's like, even I used to listen to more Rogan than I do now, but even when Rogan gets into like his read, I just skip it immediately. The reads that I will listen to are the host read ads when I actually think the host uses the product and they have their own personality within the ad. Then I like pay attention. And I actually kind of enjoy those kind of reads because they almost become part of the show. You cannot fake authenticity as much as you want to try as a podcaster. Yeah. And I am uncertain as to whether or not Spotify inserting ads dynamically, even with AI, can get me to listen. But I'm being way too like internal on my analysis, and I should look at much more data to convince me that maybe I'm wrong, but it just seems like an uphill climb to me. Well, I think you know that one is going to lead to better success. It might just be more work in terms of like curated, like actual organic and original ad reads going to do better than... All right, I'm um, Joe Rogan. Here's Alpha Brain for the 47th time on the pod. Some yeah. pre-recorded thing. I know what you mean. So you know what Canva is, right? The yeah. App, yeah, the web app. So we're advertising for Canva right now on my podcast. And they're like, have you ever used Canva? And I'm like, I should be the poster boy of your web app. Because <laughs> I was like, I felt like, oh, do I use Canva? Like I reply to the media agency. I'm like, here is my account history. I've been subscribed for eight years when this was like an MVP. Like when like they started in Australia and I was like the first Canadian user ever. And so I said like, if you want to give me free credits, that's great. But like, I'm still going to be a customer after. And so that ad read, you can tell I'm not BSing. Like you can't make up that you've been using the product for close to a decade. That's just... Well, you can, but you'll be lying. <laughs> like, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Well, it goes back to sales, right? So like in a way you're pitching Canva and me pitching Stratosphere was really easy. So that's not hard for me to try to sell, right? And if people ping me and they're like, what do you think of this? That was really easy. So thank you, man. Yeah, dude. Thank you. I mean, look, thanks for reaching out and thanks for making the product that you made. It made it a nice partnership and yeah, it's been fun. So I hope that I drove some awareness and we'll see what happens in the future too. Absolutely. And I'm pumped to see you in the flesh. And yeah, that's right. In Omaha. Two yeah, weeks, we should yeah. hang out. Yeah, I'm down, man. We like there's a good group of of guys that I'm just like really excited to meet and women as well that I'm really pumped to meet at Berkshire. And you're definitely one of them. My only commitment to myself is that I can't find myself in upstream brewery the entire time. Last <laughs> time I was in upstream, like every event seemed like it was in upstream and I'm not staying at upstream for more than two straight hours this time. I, I may leave and come back, but I'm getting out <laughs> and I am getting continuous about. Continuous. Yes. More than two hours. Yeah. I really felt like I was there for almost six straight hours last year. And I was like, I just can't do this. But a lot of really good events are there and- People come in and out, so it makes sense. What's one thing I got? I can't miss? I really don't know that you can answer that question. I would hang out across the street from the convention center, and I would not be afraid to approach people and be kind. And if you can lead with something that shows that you know who that person is and that you're genuinely interested, that would be what I would do. I don't know that there's like a must-go-to event or right. something. I've been to the Columbia dinner a couple times. That's good, but... 
do you have to go? No, you don't have to go. Gabelli does a thing Friday morning that I'll probably go to. I've enjoyed that every time I've gone. But most of my fondest memories have been just what the interactions that I've had around the events, not the actual event. Right. I think that's so. Everyone kind of says that, right? It's like, it's, yeah, it's great. You're there for that. And then all the great conversations that happen outside yeah. of that. Like last year, I saw Marilyn Whitmer. I was like, hey, I just asked her a couple questions. She answered me. Like, just wild, man. There's, if people are walking around, and a lot of the people that are walking around are bigger names than most people know. And people don't even know who they are. So they don't even pay attention to them. If you know who they are, and you just go up and say hi, everyone will say hi back. It's a very cool event. So <laughs> I'm going to be, because I'm not a professional money manager. I don't know who the big names are. I just build software and hope that those people like what I'm building. And so I'm going to be the chump that like says hi to like all these guys and like have no clue. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, That's all right. Yeah. But maybe but you'll meet you know, people charmed by the fact that I have absolutely no idea who they are. Yeah. And what brings you here? Why are you interested? How long have you owned the stock? Like you got common ground, just strike up conversations. You're going to meet interesting people guaranteed. Unreal. Okay. Dope, man. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the pod. I look forward to hanging out and uh, thanks for the sponsorship. It's been fun. Of course, sir. All right. Let's, let's keep in touch.